morning, everyone. I'm particularly proud of myself that I brought this guest to you tonight. Thank you very much, Claudia Rankin, no, for coming you. to us to Vienna. Thank you. Thank you. We had already, uh, for years I followed your work and I always wanted you to come here and it was difficult with the pandemic but also because you were in New York. Uh, to introduce you a little bit better, I mean people I'm sure have sort of looked into your, your work uh, before coming here, but um, what is not so known in Europe, I think, that you are being called sort of a necessary intellectual. You know, sometimes intellectuals, it's good to have them, it's nice to entertain, <laughs> it's good to have the thinking, but then there are intellectuals or public, um, public intellectuals that are necessary to take a conversation in hand, not only in their hand, but sort of help people also to have a conversation. And what we have now in, in our society, I think, due to uh, polarization is an inability often to have a conversation with people uh, about the topics that we need to talk about. And one of the things that you did with this book, Just Us, uh, which is basically a, you describe in a very entertaining also and very serious but very entertaining way how you try to get into a conversation with white people about whiteness, which is also something I think is particularly uh, necessary uh, as it is as a white person because I think a lot uh, of these conversations have not been had yet. You are in general at the moment teaching at uh, NYU in New York. Mm -hmm. You are a professor of creative writing. You had before uh, the poetry chair at Yale before that you were uh, in Pomona, I think, yeah, Pomona, in, in California. Yeah, in California yeah. <coughs> so you had a long academic career. You have every honor that a, uh, a writer and poet could have. You have been uh, accepted to the Academy of American Poets in 2005. Since 2019, you are in the Academy of American Poets. Since 2020, Academy of Arts and Sciences. So there is a very long list of honors that people have bestowed you with, if that's the correct yes. word. Um, and you have you have uh, published, of course, a long list of um, of of poetry, of books, of recently also plays. <coughs> we'll talk about uh, some of them tonight. I hope. Uh, because they are relevant also to your to the conversation you are trying to have that can be uh, in in books, it can be in talks, it can be at universities, it can also be in theaters, which could be a very good uh, next um, project for you. But um, what I thought was so engaging in 2017 when you got a MacArthur uh, Genius Grant. Um, you didn't take it home and have a nice uh, dinner with your family, but you actually uh, invested or put it as a foundation to create um, an institute uh, for racial imaginary uh, in order to be able to start this conversation um, on all these topics that uh, I already said, but also um, to give it somehow a home. And I, I wanted to um, ask you about this also because I think you still don't have a house for it. But in 2017, when this whole thing happened, that people uh, thought, okay, Claudia Rankin is anchoring herself as a uh, author and poet and academic in an institute in order to have a conversation. I felt it was maybe a response to the election of Donald Trump. Was it? Well, everything is a response to the election of Donald Trump <laughs> at this point, but no, it, it was in part, um, 
a collection of activities that had happened both personally and publicly. Um, I don't want to get into the weeds, but um, I had a colleague who wrote a poem about Serena Williams in which he referred to Serena and Venus as um, animals. And this is, you know, a colleague who I am in meetings with weekly. And I do not do anything. I, I, you know, initially I take it as a, it's his thing. I am his colleague. My job is not to criticize my colleagues. Um, but a student in my class said to me, how is it that he is allowed to write this and no one has said anything publicly? And I said, well, I don't want to, and this is, you know, I really was, I, in a, right now I feel like it was a cowardly position, but I, I was like, no, I don't want to get into that with you. But why don't I ask him to come to the class and talk about why he feels it's okay to depict black people in this way after all we know. But also, can I ask, it was a, a newspaper column where he actually no, compared them he to had, what he, can... I mean, it was know, a what? poem. It was a book. Oh. He published a book. And in the book were poems that they were horrible. And um, so I said to him, hey, you know, my students would like you to come and talk about why you wrote these poems. And full disclosure... They think they're racist. I think they're racist. Um, but we would love to hear your thinking behind the making of these. He said to me, sure, I'll come. I thought, oh, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> so he came. And, you know, this was like a Thursday. Class was a Tuesday. He came the following Tuesday. And he arrived in the classroom and he said... First of all, I don't want questions from any of you. I don't need to explain anything to any of you. It's not, I, I'm not here to justify myself to you people. Not a good beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't go down so well with Didn't everyone. Yet. But there was a black woman, in, the only black woman in the classroom. She said, but... All of the white women said nothing. And the single black woman said, um, I, I, oh, because he also said, what I write is for white people. I don't need to justify it for anybody else. <laughs> and so she said, how can you say that, professor? As a black woman, if I wrote something and said, I'm just writing it for black people and white people don't need to, I don't think that would work in an academic institution mm -hmm. inside the classroom. He said, who asked you to speak? <laughs> That's incredible. So it was actually, incredible uh, and dismissive and horrible. And so I, at that point, said, you know, I don't think this is working out. Thank you. Goodbye. He then called me up and berated me. I said, look, I understand we have no practice mm. talking about race. There's no practice in this culture with people of different races discussing race, especially publicly. So that's really where it started because that incident ended up becoming more and more and more public. Um, Years later, that black woman published a novel with the same press that he publishes mm. from and that I publish from. And there was a, there's a big writing convention and, in, and they were both there and he wrote a poem 
describing her as, he said, he, he reads this to a room full of thousands of people, that black women are getting support in their, um, ha you know, with their black tight dresses, and I don't, I can't even, you know. And then she had to get up and read her work after this. And afterwards she said to him, why did you do that? And he said, if the shoe fits. So she called me and she said, this, I have to do something. And I said, you don't do anything. I'll do something. Mm. And so I began, I, uh, that's when it sort of mm. began. And till today, you don't have a place for the Institute. It is still sort of um, you are you are having events uh, in different uh, organizations or in the in museums and we have the way we work. The Racial Imaginary Institute is a consortium of curators. Some of them in Europe, some of them in the United States. We meet every Sunday for one hour, and we talk about the project that will determine the next two years. So the last two years was nationalism. It was on nationalism. Before that, it was on whiteness. And we will start up again mid-October, and we will gear up for the events that will be on voting, on representation and voting. Mm -hmm. And so we're sort of spread out. What we do is then we go to institutions, like we might come to you and say, within the purview of what you do, how can you address this issue? Knowing that we are also interested in how whiteness plays, in how it will unfold. So we need that component also covered. And the institution might say, well, in our space, we can support an, uh, a conversation. In our space, we can support a gallery show. In our space. And then we, once we have all of those commitments, we make the calendar. Right now, we're looking at the calendar for 2024. And so those events will happen all over. We had, and it doesn't have to be in a space, it can also be full magazine. Um, they did a spread, you know, people will do what, what they do. And we tried to keep it as open, as democratic, as fungible as possible. And so far it works. And we, you know, we pay one person um, a salary just for, to keep things mm, organized. Yeah, mm. exactly. It's very interesting because when, um, getting caught in my own sort of uh, uh, look at the world as a white person, you, you, you think Claudia Rankin um, founds an institute for, uh, for racial imaginary. And so it will probably deal with the question of race and how black people and society and how it, it interacts, what the problems are. So in fact, what you did, as you just said, the first two years were designated to explaining to people whiteness mm -hmm. and to inviting actually white people to think about um, uh, white supremacy, which I think is not your f necessarily your favorite term. It's you have different terms that you also use, like internalized white dominance mm -hmm. makes it maybe a little bit more palpable. Yeah, because I think white, I think white people, when you hear white supremacy, you think Nazism, I don't, that's not me. I don't do that. But if you think white dominance, you think, um, what does it mean to be in a job where everyone I see is white? What does it mean that in my house, the guests that I have had over the course of my entire life have all been white? That the dominance of the, the prevalence of whiteness becomes both a choice as well as the reality. You know, there is the reality, it just happened, but you're making choices constantly in terms of who you fraternize with, who you work, who you hire, why you hire those people, what 
the similarities are? You know, people often say, well, it's not about the race of the person, it's just that I feel more comfortable around them. So that's why we had to hire them. And, and then that question is, what is that comfort? Where did that come from? And why does it line up racially? So those are the kinds of questions that we try and bring forward. You can talk about anything, and then you can talk about that thing relative to whiteness. And do you have the feeling that um, this has shifted, the conversation has shifted in the last years? So when, when Donald Trump was elected, uh, everyone was sort of very uncomfortable uh, it, on, on that specific conversation also, because it seemed as if there was a majority, wasn't really in the voting process, but more or less a majority in America that would think an openly racist person could be elected president. And did you have the same feeling? Were you shocked or did you think it was more a sort of manifestation of something that a lot of people of color have had known their whole lives? I think, I think um, in general, people of color knew that it was likely he would be elected. I think the people who were shocked were white people, who were liberal white people, who condone the policies that underline many of his um, commitments, um, but would never say that they condone him. Mm. Um, I, this is anecdotal, but before the election, the chair of my department, who is an incredibly smart man, white guy, um, we had lunch and he said, Claudia, what do you think is going to happen tomorrow? And I said, I think, you know, Trump is going to be elected. And he said, see, there you go again, <laughs> saying everything is about race. And I, but I had been, if you, <clears throat> Yale is... In New Haven, if you, my daughter went to school at Choate, which is in Wallenford, 20 minutes from where we live, white supremacists, and you could call them cells, are all over the country once you move out of the cities. So if you are paying attention why wouldn't you understand that all of those people would consequently not support him? You know, of course they're going to support him. Um, and then, and then, you know, liberal whites act like it's a big surprise when they themselves have allowed these people have voted in these people in the Senate, in the House, in the Supreme Court. I mean, right now, the more interesting thing than Donald Trump is January 6th. Because what we're seeing is that that insurrection was supported from the Supreme Court down. There are people in the Supreme Court, in the Senate, and in the House who supported, funded, opened the doors to the Americans who who came in to try and um, make the election you mean invalid? Directly. directly so directly. who in the Supreme Court? Well, for example, T Clarence Thomas's mm -hmm. wife. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's right. I read that. Is is now being investigated. Mm. So that means anything Clarence Thomas said about whether or not people should be investigated should never have been allowed mm. because he always knew that she was involved. So the, the entire structure is frightening at this point. And, you know, I think what we don't talk about is the fact, and we saw it recently when Trump is in office, um, Mitch McConnell made it his personal business to appoint judges all across the United States. He filled all of the empty judges 
as many as he could. And so when Trump was able to go to that judge in Florida who um, said that the, the um, papers shouldn't be released, he was pointing to that work. Um, luckily, some of the judges that were appointed by him are now not supporting him. But, you know, it's, it's not just a single man and his um, racist attitudes. It's an in entire structure. Of course, and it's also um, um, if he comes back or not, I mean, the ones that Designs. might come in instead of him might yeah. be like the the Floridan um, and he senator. didn't create, it might be much yeah. more complicated yeah. to deal with him. He's much younger, smarter, flexible, and might be much more radical and effective in his... More effective, yes, I think so. He had the, I don't know if you know DeSantis, the governor of Florida, he recently implicated um, don't say gay and in the university. So we're in a situation in the United States that's not that different from 1933 Germany, where the universities are being attacked and you are not, DeSantis is asking for people in the universities in Florida, students and faculty to state their political affiliations. In 2022. Public, publicly. Yeah. And so, and, you know, if certain classes are taught, like there was a class on white, the construction of whiteness in um, Wisconsin, the university was told that if they did not remove the class, funding to the university would be cut by the state. So it's very consistently across the country being policed. The narratives, the story of what America is, is under assault. So, I mean, there's quite a struggle. I mean, on the university level, you have um, these things that happen. You have on the on the in the state level, you have a huge debate on education, on on syllabus, on libraries, what books are Band being books, yeah. uh, allowed to for yeah. students to be read. Um, and a lot of this comes from a radical right agenda uh, politically. Mm -hmm. There's also what we at the moment hear a lot from American universities, um, a debate on free speech coming from the theoretically at least progressive side. So can you tell us what, how do you see that? Where's the real th threat actually coming from? I mean, are there real problems that you would have as a professor now switching from Yale to NYU, um, sort of both universities, sort of top elite schools in the, in the American spectrum. Um, do you feel that there's a problem with free speech or is the problem more on the side um, that, you know, the, the, the right, the far right is trying to close down um, the, the academic freedom? I think it's more the far right. Uh, you know, free, the question of free speech is always being contested, whether or not X person should be allowed to speak. This has gone on forever. I, you know, on the, uh, the cancel culture in the United States is very real right now. Um, but I, my feeling about that is that is a product of the times in the way that trigger warnings are a product of the times and it will play itself out. But the right use of um, policing, that's different because that we are talking about actual legislation. Mm. And the legislation is then not combatable. I know this. Like, Vicious little <laughs> yeah. um, So I, 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 that worries me more. I mean, 
because I, I think once the legislation is in there, then people are um, vulnerable to the state. And, and then things can happen. DeSantis, I went to give a talk in Florida and it was, I, it was, you know, right after COVID or in the time of COVID, since COVID is not over. So they had limited the number of people who could be in the actual space. And everyone else had signed up on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And five minutes before the talk was to commence, the internet went down. Hmm. And people were like, what? This has never happened before. You don't, and there was no one to say, I know who did this, but it happened. So I think DeSantis is a mi sort of a microcosm of what mm. could happen across the board. And it wouldn't be at Yale, I don't think, or at Harvard, but it will touch the state universities because those are tied to government funding. And then that means the students are under surveillance and the professors are under surveillance. And you know, I, I know um, professors who have refused to speak out at this point because the harassment is so, I, you know, the kinds of stuff. I have a file, yo big, of hate mail. And Yale and I talked about it and they said, you know, unless it's coming to your house, as long as it's coming through the university, it's okay. Um, and then stuff started coming to my house. So at a certain point you have to decide, do I want this? Is this okay? Do I take this on for my family as well as myself? Mm. You know, so it's, I, 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 I don't think we can underestimate what's happening. Well, I mean, the storm on January 6th on the Capitol, of course, raised for the first time, not only on a, on a local level, the question if the police is on the right side, meaning on the, Side, side of the of the people, <laughs> or if it's if it's on the side of uh, insurrection and and mm -hmm. and like this. And so what you are saying now is also this um, feeling of instability and of danger and threat. Is is that something where you think it could also happen on a local level with police that would not protect your house, or no, do you? No, I think not? that happens now, because that sort of brings, of course, back. Um, um, a lot of the, you know, America had seen has seen a lot of violence on the streets um, mm -hmm. and often directed against people of color, black people, got uh, harmed, beaten up, also killed, mm -hmm. and that is something which, until January six, wasn't the main danger on people's minds. So is that? Back, that there might be actual violence on the streets again? I think everybody is terrified about what will happen in the next year and a half. Mm. This idea that violence is just a minute away. Um, I think if you talk to most people in the United States right now, people are... Aware, I would use the word aware, aware <laughs> that white supremacists in the United States are organized and they're organized and connected and supported by the infrastructure. And if, and this is why Trump remains in the forefront of the conversation and why the Republicans refuse to disavow him because he still has control 
a controlling voice that organizes much of the radicalized white people in in America. And you know, the the FBI came forward and said that even though Americans like to believe that the radicalized groups are Muslim or you know whatever, it's actually white men in the country. That's what the numbers show, that the violence that is being committed against um, blacks, Jews, immigrants, and other white people are from we will not be replaced people. You will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. I mean, the fact that those people were out in the streets chanting those things. And the repeal of Roe versus Wade is tied to the replacement theory. The idea that white babies must be had. So white women need to be making those babies. And they should no longer have the choice to decide to abort them. Because the numbers need to be increased. So it's all one story. It's not sort of a random. But as much as this is one story, and you know, we have a neighboring country here, Hungary, where also the family family policy of Viktor Orban are, of course, also in order to stem the flow of immigrants and create Hungarian babies, mm -hmm. women should have more children, and so on and so on. In our own history, of course, that was big part of the Nazi ideology mm -hmm. was to create blonde babies with mm -hmm. blue eyes, etc. But as much as this is one side of the story in the States, you also have, don't you have, let me ask this post as a mm -hmm. question, a coalition of forces that are now also working together to not let this happen. Um, so you have parts of the Democratic Party, you have um, a very white old man president who uh, plays a role in all this I, I would like to ask if you think he plays a, a good role uh, in at this moment. You have um, the abortion question has brought out a lot, a lot of young women of all parts of the society being enraged that this uh, right is being taken away from them. So you have different parts of the society that can actually advocate make together, yeah. mm -hmm. make a difference. So is there any sense of optimism that you could take from that? You know, it's funny because everybody always says to me, Claudia, where's the optimism? Where's the hope? <laughs> <laughs> we, need yeah, um, we need it. But I, and the, the fact of the matter is the registration for white women have gone up. Mm -hmm. And that is good. Um, what is distressing is that it took this to get that. We had years of police violence. We had everything else happening. And only when somebody says, you white lady, we might tell you not to do something, do they show up. So does that mean that they will show up in that narrow way? Or will they show up understanding the intersectionality of the entire infrastructure. We don't know. History has said no, but we, we will see. We have a much more educated um, population around these issues, I think. Um, so that's also good. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. Is uh, it enough what Biden is doing? Biden is doing great. I, I, you know, I think he's addressing many things that need addressing, but Biden is a single person. We have, uh, a, a, you know, three branches of government. Um, we will see what happens. I, I really think um, as long as we have an electoral college, we're always going to be in trouble because it means that the will of the people is still tempered by a small group of white men. And so I want to say 
that grassroots organizations, the kinds of things that Stacey Abrams was able to make happen in Georgia in terms of um, the election of those two senators. But the minute that happened, you then had um, voter restrictions put in. So you get two steps forward, five mm -hmm. steps back. And if you're holding all of the things in mind at one time, it's hard to, to make statements like, I'm optimistic that. Yeah, also we shouldn't, I mean, it's yeah. also not necessary. We don't have to have a 100% yeah, but, uh, answer. But, but I'm saying for me, yeah. it's hard because it, I see this happening, but I also see that happening. And the Republicans are, are, are rootless and the Democrats are... Ruthless or ruthless? Ruthless, the yeah. Republicans. And the Democrats are committed to a narrative that keeps them at times ineffectual against the ruthlessness of the Republicans. You know, it's that thing that Michelle Obama said, they go, when they go low, we go high, but when they go low, we go out. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, we can hold the moral ground as um, Democrats, but then the actual laws, legislation, mm -hmm. et cetera, are being put in place by the Republicans. But that's also, you know, in order to change the election law, uh, you would need sort of a huge reform with yeah. which can only come from the Democratic Party yeah. because the Republicans profit from it. So how to achieve it? Is this what you are trying also in the Institute that you, you said you're focusing the next two years will be on voting uh, rights and representation? Is this part of it? It's part of it in terms of the educational aspect. Um, I think people, one of the things I've realized over you know, a lifetime, 60 years, is that people know what they know and then they don't know the other stuff. And, and they're not um, institutions out there that are trying to just get people up to speed. One, you know, Ken Burns, I love Ken Burns because I love that his documentaries are really about just educating us on all of the aspects around a single issue. And so I think at the Institute, that's our intent for the next, just to look at what, what the voter registration laws have done to help um, with voter registration and also to think creatively about different ways of thinking about how to approach the question of getting rid of the electoral college. You know, January 6th, if you watched it closely, the most important thing that was said was said by Mitch McConnell. He said, let them have this vote. Let's not get all crazy around Biden's election as long as we maintain the electoral college. Because with that, we will always have control. And so, you know, he's right. And so I think, you know, that should be our concern. It's, it looks impossible to dismantle, but that should be the mm. thing that we're going after. But we saw now in the primaries before the midterm elections this fall that most of the candidates that won in the Democratic um, Party were the moderate, the centrist uh, candidates, um, which could also mean that they, they can win because they sort of could get some of the center-right uh, votes in the end. Do you think that this is a good chance that the midterm elections could not end as disastrously as they usually end for the ruling party? I hope so. I mean, I, I think again, I, you know, I wish somebody else was here because I, <laughs> I, 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 I feel like I have lived a life of disappointment 
with moderate liberal white Americans. Mm. And so it's hard for me to believe that they will actually step up, fully step up. But it does seem, and if there is a moment to be hopeful, it seems like it might be now. It does seem like people for the first time are willing to believe that people are not good at heart. Mm. You know, they, we've had sort of a country of white extremists and then Chamberlains, people who are willing to believe that some goodness is going to suddenly arrive in Hitler's heart at the last hour. It's not going to happen. And so... But I, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I have many white women friends who um, seem for the first time in their lives, and these are women in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, who for the first time seem to be saying, actually, there is a problem. And this is very different from before when they would say, it's hard to know the whole story. That was the the previous position. It's hard to know. But now for the first time, I think you have that population. And what white women in the United States need to understand is that they actually have a lot of power. Mm. If they were willing to give up alliance with white men. And do you see them in an alliance? The white men and the white women. Yeah, if you look at the voting, they tend they to vote for. with their husbands. Still. Still. I mean, the, the um, white, single, educated white women vote Democratic. But the white, married women vote Republican with their husbands. Mm -hmm. The question is now with Roe, the repeal of Roe versus Wade, will they break? Yeah. I mean, I thought it was also interesting that I read that you said um, that in your new theater project, the new play that you're writing about, uh, that you're writing about um, the female black perspective. And I was wondering, I can totally un understand that this interests you, but I was wondering how, what the different experience of black women versus black men, what is it, what interests you that you want to work um, about it? Well, right now, um, while I'm at the academy in Berlin, I am, I, somebody handed me the script of a conversation between James Baldwin and Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde is a yeah, poet who lived, who lived many years in Berlin. Um, James Baldwin, you all know who James Baldwin is. Um, in 1983, they were asked by Essence magazine to have a public conversation. And it was an interesting moment in both their lives. Lord had just been diagnosed with breast cancer the year before. So she's coming into this conversation now in chemo, thinking that she could die. You know, she ends up living almost 20 years. But at that time, there's no way to know that. Baldwin is two years from his death. He has cancer. He knows he's dying. And so they sit down to have this conversation. And Baldwin says, um, the problem in the United States and in the world is a structure of whiteness. White people have dominated, have are racist, have put in place racism, have killed Jews, have, you know, annihilated Native Americans, have incarcerated black people. Below everything, this is the problem. Audre Lorde says that might be the problem, but 
black men are killing black women. And you are a black intellectual man. Can you not talk to black men and tell them that black women are not a punching bag for their frustrations coming out of a white world? Baldwin says to Lord, you are blaming black men for white people. And she says, I'm not blaming. I'm asking for accountability. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and, and then they go at it. Mm -hmm. Because he refuses to say that white men should be excused or outside, you know, and she ends up saying, look, if I'm out at night, I am viable to be raped by a black man as much as I am viable to be raped by a, a white man. So both of you are treating me in the same way. Even if you think the white man is making you do it. But it, 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 it escapes me a little bit that he couldn't see her point. It doesn't mean that he needs to designate his entire work maybe to this, uh, no, to what he, she needed him to do. Yeah. But I mean... Well, he, he says that it clouds the issue. Mm. But this was 80s, beginning of the 80s. 83. 83. It clouds the issues a little bit like as if when, when women asked to get the voting rights, a lot of the men said, like, oh, this is a side issue in the in history we don't need to deal with that now right right and they were wrong then and they were wrong, wrong then and he was wrong now and it's a interesting i'm interested in that conversation because i think for a long time black people have not been able to address certain issues in the black community because they're afraid of what white people will do with it mm. you know so the idea is if you say as a black woman, I am being beaten up by this black guy. White people will say, see, that's why they need to be killed and put in prison, because look what they're doing in their own homes. The, the, it will be reduced to that. But was this his um, argument? You think his motivation? This Because that I could, to a certain extent, understand when you're I fighting think, for... I think it's under uh, there. I think uh, it's... Because he says, he keeps saying to her, you're blaming black people when you should be looking at white people. Mm. And she's like, but it's black, it's black men who are beating me up. I mean, it's a fucked up conversation on another level because both of them are gay. Mm -hmm. And nobody's talking about that. Mm -hmm. You know, so she's like, you need to be, you need to come and be a father to my son. I'm like, but lady, you're living with a white lady in a marriage with your child. That is a family. Mm. So Baldwin doesn't need to come into your house. But, you know, so they're both invested in this heteronormative construction of what family looks like, the role of men in the lives of women, you know, all of it. So it's a, it's a, I, I, I find it very interesting. And so I'm interested in bringing it back. Mm -hmm. And also Baldwin, everybody loves Baldwin. Baldwin is a person and he's complicated. He's like Jefferson. You know, Jefferson walked around Europe saying, get rid of slavery, he's an abolitionist. Mm -hmm. And then he had his slaves and he refused to get rid of them because they were part of his mortgage. He had mortgaged his, in order to buy the wine and the paintings and everything, he mortgaged Monticello, and the slaves were part of the value of that house. But, it, but he was a dedicated abolitionist. And so Baldwin, Baldwin is even also... He died in Saint Paul de Vence, <laughs> didn't yeah. he? On the Côte d'Azur. Exactly. So he left, actually, his, his state in France. Mm -hmm. But can we let people out of this not of the responsibility but out of their guilt of you know having been slave owners so how do we 
go f in this debate from here because your book is full, of course, of these conversations where the littlest things, of course, resonate with the entire History. debate <laughs> yeah so when in your uh, i love the, the your attempts to get into conversation with white men on planes and then finally when she gets into a conversation with one because she usually doesn't dare to even start it and i think not because you're not confident enough but because you already you 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 are sort of afraid of the conversations you will need to have uh, mm -hmm. because it's often it goes like in a script that you then have this conversation with this man whose son didn't get into Yale and he says it's because all the minorities are getting in and his poor white middle class son doesn't get mm -hmm. accepted and so you know where do you start and where do you find also for yourself a level of where you can not get frustrated by over and over having the same, same conversation on it's about mm. responsibility not about personal guilt it is about etc well i you know i um those conversations i had they were half amusing because they the script gets employed and you're like okay here we go here we go here we go um just just recently somebody said um he couldn't get a job because the administration was dedicated to diversity. I'm like, and then I was just on the, this is, I'm rambling a little bit, but I, what I feel like we all need is a list of all of these people that are supposedly hired that are not hired. You know, there are, if you look at the Senate, if you look at the House, it's still a majority white institution, and yet no, it's not only a majority; it's like sixty-three yeah, percent. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's a big majority. And in the in the institutions, in my departments, where people are claiming that black people are taking their jobs and women. There's still you look around the room. You're still looking around and seeing a room full of white people. And my best um, situation the other day, somebody said um, to a black guy at a conference, you only got this job because you're black. I wish you had gotten it for merit. And the guy said, that's right, I got it because I'm black. And as a black person, I had to work twice as hard as you. And the reason I have it as a black person is because I outmatched you so far that they had to give it to me, which is true. I mean, the black people who end up getting um, hired, like um, Judge Jackson, they have to do twice as much to get that. And then they become the person who is replacing everybody who is still there who's still in the room. So it's, it's just, you know, disheartening and also funny. But those conversations that are in the, um, in the book, they, they played out in ways that were expected until they didn't. So the final guy who I spoke to who said he didn't see color, and that's, you know, white people, a lot of white people think that's the goal not to see color when in fact color whiteness as well as brown people black people we're all making calculations in our head all the time based on what we see and also in terms of gender so to say you don't see stuff is just magical thinking you are you are doing everything you're doing, whether or not you're opening the door or not opening the door, whether or not you're stepping aside or not stepping aside, whether or not you feel a little anxious, has to do with seeing who is in front of you. And if you don't feel anxious, it's because you see a reflection of yourself. You know, my husband who is white, he went into a building and they just opened the door for him. And then I was behind him, and they, they came and said, how can we help you? 
And he said to them, of the two of us, wouldn't you think that I'm the bigger threat to you than she is? So why are you letting me in here and not asking me anything? And then stopping her at the door. So those are the kind, you know, those so kind. They were embarrassed? What, what happened? They were embarrassed. Oh. Um, he, the guy, um, became very nice when we left. He was like, bye, mm -hmm. good night. Mm -hmm. Good night, Mrs. And Mr. <laughs> Have a good life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't come back. But, <laughs> but overly, you know, he was overly um, friendly. Um, because once it's pointed out, it becomes very clear mm -hmm. what's happening. But um, the guy, the last guy in the conversation on the plane, he, he when I said to him, you know, that thing you said doesn't make any sense. He was able to take it in. Mm. He was able to say, you're right, it doesn't make any sense. And we were able to have a conversation from that moment and move and open out into other things. And he and I have stayed in contact since then. Because that's what I, I basically like about your method, um, um, as I call it. Um, because in all these overly uber depressed uh, discussions we have at the moment on basically every subject because everything is so complicated and really depressing but the way you just make a point in actually calling it out but without you know destroying necessarily your not even opponent but you know you could really just simply embarrass people deeply when you call out their um, unconscious bias and their sort of uh, learned white supremacy that they haven't ever questioned. Um, you could do that or you have this conversation, let, you don't let it go, but you might have a, a positive, they might take something away from it and sort of, I mean, let's not say like learn from it because that sounds also very mm -hmm. sort of... Um, but, but continue the conversation. But begin continue to, the conversation. Begin to question. Um, you know, I'm not interested in telling anybody what they should or shouldn't do. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know what anyone should do. I don't know what I should do sometimes. But I am interested and in, in asking people why they think what they think. Do they even know why they think what they think? And that's a question I have for myself. You know, sometimes when something happens, I, I'm like, why did I do that? Why did I feel that? Why did I say that? That to me is interesting. And can lead to, you know, the minute I feel like I have lost my flexibility as a thinker, I think I should leave the classroom because that's not my idea of what should be happening inside that. I'm not there to tell anybody what to do, but I am there to try and figure out ways in which we can continue to question what we know. What does it mean to want an age-old call for change not to change, and yet also to feel bullied by the call to change. How is a call to change named shame, named penance, named chastisement? How does one say, what if, without reproach? The root of chastise is to make pure. The impossibility of that is that what repels and not the call for change? And the final paragraph section of that is, um, what is it we want to keep conscious, to stay known, even as we say, each in our own way, I so love, I know, I shrink, I am asked, I'm also, I react, I smell, I feel, I think, I've been told, I remember, I see, I didn't, I thought, I felt, I failed, I suspect, I was 
doing, I'm sure, I read, I needed, I wouldn't, I was, I should have, I felt, I could have, I never, I'm sure, I asked. You say, and I say, but what is it we are telling? What is it we are wanting to know about here? What if what I want from you is new, newly made, a new sentence in response to all my questions, a swerve in our relation and the words that carry us, the care that carries. I am here without the shrug, attempting to understand how what I want and what I want from you run parallel. Justice and the openings for just us. Ladies and gentlemen, Claudia Rankin, thank you very much. Thank you.